Good morning. Thank you for having us on the program. This is joint work with Miguel Anton, Florian Eder, and Martin Schmalz. And the paper, this paper is about the rising common ownership, competition, and top management incentives. Now, when we think about top management incentives, we think of pay for performance, right? Paying a, a bonus for performance. And uh, the downside of that is that there are exogenous demand shocks that you may want to uh, filter out. You don't want your agent to be exposed to. The traditional solution has been to use relative performance evaluation, right? This is OMS from 82. And the question that we ask is, well, well, relative to whom, right? We are going to use relative performance evaluation. RPE gives me, as a manager, a very strong incentive to push the performance of my company forward, right? But as well, it gives me equally strong incentives to make the performance of my peers worse. Now, when does this matter? It matters when firms strategically interact, and therefore they can impose a negative externality onto their peers. Now, assume that I'm an owner in several uh, companies within an industry. As an owner, I'm not going to have a very, you know, it's not going to be in my interest that they compete very hard, right? I'd rather have them cooperate a little bit more. So when we have these two conditions, when firms strategically interact and we have common owners that may want to encourage a little bit more of, of uh, cooperation rather than competition, what we should see is that relative performance evaluation is used less. We're going to have less. And this is what the paper is about, theoretically and empirically. This is what we claim. Now, you can think about this paper combining these two ideas. The idea of Olstrom 82 that says, well, assume that firms want to maximize own profit, then you can use RPE with an exogenous benchmark. Now, we have hard says, well, but when firms interact strategically, and therefore industry performance is endogenous, own profit maximization is no longer the unanimous objective. And the authors put these two ideas together, in fact, in another paper in 87, saying to what extent will the conduct of firms be different from the assumed profit maximization behavior? And if it differs, what ramifications does it have for market outcomes? So the goal of this paper from a theory perspective is to think about what are the optimal managerial incentives when we have two key ingredients, when firms interact strategically, and that we're, here we're going to follow Agrawal and Sam with uh, JF99 pretty closely, and as well we have common owners. And therefore, firms are going to have an incentive to internalize the externalities that they impose to their peers. We will take the, what the theory tells us, the proposition from the theory, and see if, it, if, uh, if the data speaks about that. On the identification front, we are going to be using um, a shock, to, uh, an exogenous shock to ownership that comes from a mutual fund scandal in 2003. Uh, this has been used by Anton and Paul before. And as well, the paper provides additional evidence on the rise of common ownership across different industries. Very good. How does this paper connect to the RPE literature? The RPE literature is extensive, and it's mainly concerned about the idea, well, what can we do to make managers do what shareholders want, right? You know, to avoid this pay for luck. What we actually do is take a different angle in this, in this literature and say, well, but what do really shareholders want managers to do? What do shareholders really want? Because maybe they are paying managers for luck and in or paying for industry because you know, they want that. In, an, in, an, in a scenario with common ownership, that's what shareholders want. Right. How does this paper connect to the common ownership literature? From the empirical, you know, on the empirical um, uh, aspect, uh, there are, there are uh, a batch of new papers that talk about the implications of common ownership from competition. The Athar, uh, Schmalz, Teco, and Reina, in particular, they, see, they say that as an industry becomes more commonly owned, for example, the airline industry, then prices, they seem to go up and quantities go down. Now, of course, there is a concern about this literature, well, about these papers. They say, well, you know, isn't it a big jump from ownership to prices? This is a, a pretty large jump, right? And what we try with our paper is to provide a mechanism to say, well, maybe executive compensation is the mechanism that allows us to uh, have these, these outcomes uh, uh, present. Who are these common owners? Here I show you the top, uh, well, the largest banks in the US and the top shareholders. And you can see that we have 
the usual suspects, they are present at everyone, right? So, you know, from the outset, we're going to see that Bank of America probably is not going to compete very strongly with Wells, Wells Fargo, should they have, you know, should, should they when 20% of their ownership is in hand, more or less, in the, with the same owners? Moreover, we know, for example, that you know, in September, the CIO of Berkshire Hathaway was appointed to the board of JP Morgan. Now, I'm not sure if he's going to push very much for relative performance evaluation at JP Morgan relative to Bank of America and Wells Fargo, for example. And that's exactly what we want to test with the data. Do these funds care about compensation? Yes, they do. They engage in thousands of meetings, and in half of these meetings, they actually have compensation in the agenda. And uh, BlackRock says openly that actually they engage. This is the carrot. And when the engagement doesn't work, they use the voting. They use the stick. And in fact, in 96% of the cases, they endorse compensation. Can these uh, mutual funds coordinate with the, with the top CEOs? In fact, they meet constantly, and they have you know, specific gatherings together. We have uh, casual data on that, that they, they gather to talk about strategies and, and, uh, and the directions of certain industries. OK, let me talk a little bit about the theory. So the objective is to incentivize the manager in the cheapest possible way, such that she sets the desired market strategy. And as I said, we have two ingredients. We're going to have imperfect competition, both uh, competition a la Bertrand or Cournot. And as well, we are going to have diversified shareholders. And therefore, we are going to incentivize managers to maximize shareholder value rather than own firm profits in isolation. More formally, we have two firms. They have this inverse demand function. And we have two risk neutral managers that are going to be compensated with this linear contract. The way that RPE uh, is present here, we are going to, if we have a very high alpha, positive high alpha, we're going to put a strong weight on own uh, profits. And if we have a negative beta, we're going to be cleaning for these exogenous shocks. So what we are interested in is to see how does the optimal alpha and beta change with common ownership. In terms of shareholders, we're going to have two shareholders. Shareholder A has control over firm one and the rest in firm two. And uh, shareholder B has control of firm two and the rest in firm one. Very good. And the shareholders' maximization problem is the following. So you know the shareholders are going to choose alpha and beta to maximize the value of their portfolio, subject to giving the outside option the, uh, a weight that is higher than the outside option, and as well, subject to the managers maximizing their salary by choosing the right price or the right quantity. OK. So what do we find? So the solution, both for Cournot and Bertrand, may look a little bit uh, complicated, but essentially it's giving us the same, uh, the same conclusion. So beta over alpha is going to depend on 1 minus x, which is the degree of common ownership. And we can see you know, what the proposition says is that the, an increase in common ownership, 1 minus uh, x, 1 minus x, increases the inverse compensation ratio, right? So basically, we're going to put more weight into others' performance and less weight on our own performance. Good. And that's what we want to take to see if this is the case in the data. We use pretty standard uh, data, executive compensation, CompuStat, and CRIS for, price for uh, performance and industry definitions. We obtained the ownership data from the 13F. And the definition of common ownership here is the MHHI delta. There are different definitions that we could possibly use, but we start with this MHHI delta, which comes from the antitrust uh, literature and which complements very nicely the HHI. And basically, it's a measure of concentration that focuses on the overlap of shareholders within an industry. Let me give you a sense of how this MHHI delta looks like for very broad sectors. We can see that in the beginning, in 94, they were around the level 1,000. And by 2013, it increases close to 2,000. This is a relatively important jump. In fact, if we put it in perspective, a jump of 200 points, the Department of Justice already starts to, to be concerned about these changes in concentration. Very good. So this is our baseline regression. And what we actually have here, this is total flow compensation 
our uh, alpha is going to depend or is, is going to be the coefficient for own profits and beta for uh, peers. And alpha and beta are going to be extended, are going to be including the HHI, so the concentration, as well as the MHHI delta, which captures the common ownership. And what we want to test is whether these alpha 3 and beta 3, are they different from zero? You know, does common ownership matter at all for determining uh, compensation? And then we will look how does the ratio, the inverse ratio, beta over alpha, change with changes in common ownership. OK, this is the first uh, set of results. So what we have on the left-hand side is total compensation. And on the right-hand side, we're going to have uh, own and rival performance. We, we are going to extend it by the HHI, interacted with the HHI, and interacted with common ownership. And if we focus on the first two rows, we see that when common ownership is high, right, our coefficient, right, the, the alpha 3, tends to be negative. We put less weight on own performance. And, when, and the second row is telling us that when MHHI is high, when common ownership is high, we put more weight on rivals' performance. But of course, what we are interested in is what the theory is telling us, which is something more specific that speaks to the, the, this inverse uh, ratio, the beta over alpha. How does this ratio change with common ownership? And this is the statistic, and essentially, what we find is that this change is positive and statistically significant. So it's telling us that when common ownership rises, there is less RPE. Okay. Alternative specifications. We started the paper very much following Agrawal and Samwick, but the literature has moved, has updated itself very much. So the more uh, modern specifications are using the log of TDC1 on the left-hand side, and they are using as well returns on the right-hand side. And here, we, um, again, what we see is that own tends to be, the, the weight, you know, own interacted with common ownership tends to be negative, and uh, common ownership with rival, it's either non-significant or positive. And this, um, these regressions have executive firm fixed effects. So here we are identifying the changes within, you know, within an executive that stays at the same firm. Uh, Again, um, here the coefficient, so the, the relationship between the beta and alpha is, again, uh, positive and significant, especially for the, for the executive firm fixed effects uh, regressions. Alternative specifications. The, this, uh, in, this incentive literature has moved now to consider incentives beyond flow pay, saying, well, uh, share, um, CEOs, they don't care necessarily only about how much they're going to make that year, but they care about their wealth, how much they have accumulated through time, and how does that change with performance. So what we have done here is we take the wealth performance sensitivity measures, different measures, and we're going to see how does this wealth performance varies with common ownership. Of course, we don't have the, the portfolio of the CEO in other firms, so we cannot test you know, the parallel to the beta. We can only test here the parallel of, of the alpha. So when we look into, um, here we have the wealth performance sensitivity, and we can see that it's negatively correlated with the MHHI. Very good. We have other sets of robustness tests that look into um, an equally weighted version of the MHHI delta, which is a, a very common uh, and, and valid concern, and different measures of common ownership as well, moving the MHHI delta is at the industry level, whereas you know, we can think of, of common, very intuitive common ownership measures more at the firm level as well. And that would allow us to have our fixed effects, our executive firm fixed effects stronger. Okay, that's, that's uh, an important element. Now, when we, you know, our efforts here to move a little bit more towards a causal explanation, we are using this, um, this shock, this 2003 trading scandal that affected 25 family funds. At the end of the day, this translates into really a 25% uh, of the outflows within the mutual fund uh, industry. So it was a massive reshuffling of funds from uh, scandalous funds to non-scandalous funds. And uh, we claim that hopefully this, this reshuffling is uncorrelated with future compensation contracts. 
And essentially what we are doing is instrumenting our MHHI with this ratio of the MHHI of scandalous firms over the total MHHI. And when we use the predicted values of the MHHI, we as well find, sorry, that um, the inverse compensation ratio is as well positive and statistically significant. Okay, let me talk the last few minutes about interpretation, interpreting this fact that common ownership is associated with top management incentives that may encourage less competition and more cooperation. Are we saying that BlackRock and Vanguard are sitting down and they are writing the contracts? No, we are not saying that. We are saying that, you know, it's what we are, what we are saying is that the presence of this index fund, you know, may well outcrowd activist efforts to do so. To fight for more pay for performance sensitivity, and we, you know, we, there is this this important case that Tryon uh, proxified against Dupont, that basically they lost it because all the funds, BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, they voted against this proxy fight. They didn't want, you know, a, a hypothesis would be they didn't want um, Dupont to really compete hard with Monsanto, where they have as well. They are the main shareholders there in the seed business. So there, there is this crowding out of uh, activists precisely because these index funds are getting bigger and bigger and their positions are, are increasing. As well, index funds do not seem to push for pro-competitive policies like activists. So it would be more of a, a laissez-faire type of uh, explanation. They are there sitting, but they are not pushing for, uh, for higher comp uh, stronger competition. And this is really the benign interpretation. At the same time, what we know is that they engage and that compensation is part of their agenda. That is clear. And uh, there's recent literature that tells us that this label of passive investors does not really translate into being passive owners. They actually are very interested in changing corporate governance structures of firms, but they decide not to, cho not to change compensation, maybe. The next steps of our paper, we are interested in exploring more the wealth performance sensitivity as it seems that the literature is moving towards these measures of incentives beyond just the flow. As well, we are uh, exp starting to explore the incentive lab literature the, uh, data to look more clearly into the contracts and see how the contracts change. We, we don't know uh, much about that uh, yet. However, one of our concerns is that there is so much discretion in these contracts that one thing is to have it written down, ex ante, but then exposed, you might see a different, uh, you know, a different outcome because of this, this huge discretionality on the total compensation. To conclude, this paper is about presenting these economic incentives that help rationalize why broadly diversified investors endorse relative performance insensitive compensation. And what we find both theoretically and empirically is that CEOs in more commonly owned industries, they are rewarded, rewarded less for own performance and more for uh, the performance of their peers. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Maria. Uh, the discussion is Bo Becker. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much um, for having me here to discuss um, this interesting paper. Um, all right. I have uh, 45 minutes. <laughs> no. Uh, no, I promise to uh, keep it short so that there's time for discussion. Um, this is a paper about common ownership of publicly traded companies. Um, the anti-competitive impact uh, of having the same owner in multiple companies so that owner does not want firms to compete. Um, and this is related to some recent work on common ownership and product market behavior, uh, both, um, oh, sorry, what I have, both airline pricing and bank lending rates. Um, and uh, that's getting a lot of attention. The main idea here is that when institutions own equity in firms in the same industry so that one firm's behavior impacts the profits of the other firms, then those owners, those institutions, will not want the firms to compete aggressively. 
uh, against each other. This is um, a strategy, I guess, that was perfected by the trusts around the year 1900 in the US. Um, so you monopolize an industry not by uh, combining all the acti economic activity in that industry in one firm, but under common ownership and you coordinate. Um, and of course, the underlying assumption or you know, why, why does it work like this? Well, competing aggressively usually means hurting your peers' profits. Um, and that reduces overall industry profits. Okay, I think that's not controversial that that's gonna be the case almost everywhere that's Economics 101. Um, and I think th this paper and this topic is related uh, to several patterns indicating that the level of competition is falling generally. Right? And one reason that this uh, is so, uh, getting a lot of attention. So f uh, let's see, I may have left the exact citations here in the <laughs> other version of my <laughs> PDF. <laughs> uh, but well, let's just say this, this is common knowledge at this point, or that uh, there's several important trends here. One is the shrinking labor share of GDP. Um, maybe to the advantage of uh, the capital share, or maybe uh, the profit share, if you like, so not going to wages. Um, in the US, at least, wages and median household incomes have been stagnant. What I wanted to point out is that there's some discussion in this in that literature about the effect of shrinking household size and so on. So just how bad have the last 30 years been for the US middle class? Um, that's a big topic, but they haven't, these haven't been the best 30 years. And income inequality seems to be rising. And so I was gonna cite some French book here. Um, but <laughs> yeah, so these, okay. So one, one thing that could, uh, sort of put all of this under one heading is rising monopoly power, okay? That could, and that could mean that labor basically gets less because of monopoly profits, so a smaller share of GDP goes to workers. Um, and so that's the, I think that's the background that people worried about this and that makes this uh, research even more salient. Um, and not that the authors necessarily have anything to say about income inequality, but I think that's in the background here. It does raise uh, a question which is, well, where does lower competition come from and are there alternatives to joint ownership? And I think that is an interesting conversation to have at some point. So if we believe that all of this fits very nicely with low competition in the economy, this seems like this line of research is proposing one explanation one possible explanation for why there's less competition. And once you're at that point, you would like to know, well, wait, what are the other possible forces? So I'm not necessarily saying that Maria has to, to deal with all of this in this one paper, but I think this is where the, the policy implications and the welfare implications lead you to want to investigate. All right, so there's a model here of two competitive firms, the CEOs don't exert effort, as they do in a lot of models. They set prices, and the owner set executive comp, and then incentives depend on profits and other firms' profits. So you decide to reward a CEO for that firm's profits and the other firm's profits in some combination. And if you have more ownership overlap, owners prefer less competition, higher prices, they're gonna set more weight on peer profits, less on their own profits. Uh, Okay, that went fast. Okay, this slide I guess we got all at once. Um, okay, so some comments here. So higher ownership concentration leads to higher uh, profits in this model. I think that's general, I didn't, I'm not entirely sure. All right, and so if you think that there's a world where higher ownership concentration produces higher industry profits and successful institutional investors, you could see how this would lead to increasing concentration of holdings over time. You'd think an economy where there's some kind of dynamic development of ownership would reward ownership concentration. I think maybe one thing that would give you pause is that industry and sector specialized mutual funds seems to be uh, on the way. So 
It used to be, this is just my sense, I'm not a mutual fund specialist, but it seems to me that index funds that are very broad have been gaining, whereas sector-specific mutual funds have not been gaining. Uh, and so maybe that is just something to comment on the fit here. Um, also, I want to point out that RP, that's a very academic point, you know, the lack of RP in executive compensation. That's, ooh, excuse me, that's in academia, in the public debate, it's really the level of pay that's been the main discussion point. Uh, and then both in academia and the public debate, there's been a discussion of to what extent owners influence CO pay and the say, whether or not say on pay is a good idea and so on. Um, so I think it's nice to, uh, to point out that this paper does a lot here and here, but you know the model of state it doesn't really discuss this level of pay. That's also something where you might think about, you know, it does, there's some kind of second order implication, but I think you could go f more directly after that potentially. Okay. Um, all right, and I wanted to also point out the question of the fit to time series here. So the identification throws out time series variation. I think there's good reason for that. But you might ask, ownership concentration has been rising for a time, it seems to me, okay? But rapidly since the financial crisis, just looking at the figures in the paper, and I think the model would predict that RP should be going down and pay levels up. Most definitely the first one. But my understanding is that the level of CEO pay really sort of peaked in 1999, 2000, and has been more or less flat since. I don't think that this is necessarily a sharp test because there are other things going on in the time series, but I think it's something to comment on. Does this or does this not sort of fit the uh, broad trend? All right, empirical results. So we regress annual value of executive pay on firm stock return times lag market value and the average across peers of their stock return and line market value, and they define peers in different ways, it all works. And then regression coefficients vary by industry ownership concentration. Here's that uh, key regression, where we have that one and that one, alpha three and beta three that Maria discussed. The my main finding is that the slope on your own stock return falls with concentration, so alpha, is, alpha three is negative the slope on industry stock return rises. It does seem that the effect is mostly from non-CEO executives. Um, all right. Um, I think there's a scale effect here, but maybe I misunderstood the definition of the variables. It doesn't seem necessary to have something that has this kind of scale in it. I don't know if it makes interpretation harder. All right, I wanted to make uh, one comment on this, which is using industry versus firm level identification. So I think th this paper doesn't look at the ownership concentration for a given firm. The authors focus on an industry. And I think this is a natural level of observation because there's an anti-competitive industry, then that's a statement about the whole industry. On the other hand, it does disregard some possible interest in cross-firm variation. Let me give you an example, if I can. Make my picture appear. So there's an industry with three firms, okay? Firm one is owned by a bunch of small owners. Firm two and three are owned by that same big owner, okay? And I think, uh, I think that the model makes very different predictions for these firms, okay? Now the model has only two firms, um, literally, but you could easily see how an extension would predict that firm two and three should be operating to maximize their joint profits, whereas firm one would completely disregard firm one and two. Also firm two and three would disregard firm one. Okay, now we're throwing out all of that interesting variation when we're saying, oh, on average, this industry has some level of uh, co-ownership. So it's not a criticism really, it's just saying that this, it seems like there's a rich source of variation in the data. Uh, where we have strong predictions from the model, and we would like to check it out. Uh, okay, then the, uh, let me talk quickly about the natural experiment. So Anthony and Polk, it's about a trading scandal which produced outflows, sudden and large outflows from some mutual funds and inflows into others. And I think it helps solve a general concern that the concentration in an industry is not randomly allocated, which is nice. I, f I do find that two-stage least square IV setup, a little hard to interpret. There's so much going on with the, uh, the variable definitions and 
what's really happening to concentration around this event. So I think, uh, for me, I think it would be easy to, easier to understand a simple diff and diff. Say, here's a bunch of firms where the shock raised ownership concentration. And maybe there were other firms where it lowered it and just see over time how things changed instead of this massive panel regression with multiple steps and so on. Okay, so uh, to wrap up, what about the welfare implications? So the broad welfare implications of this research agenda include A, large institutions and overlapping ownership are bad, okay? Index funds are not as good as academics have thought and here's a statement that dropped out about product markets. <laughs> so about this thing about how the having co-ownership kind of messes up product markets. All right, so these are very large. The welfare implications here are massive. The policy implications, not as clear, but there's definitely massive welfare implications. And so I think a result which both is unexpected or sort of different from what the literature has previously discussed and also has large welfare implications, does naturally face a higher bar where people ask more questions of that result than something that's expected and has small welfare implications. So what are some things that you could do uh, to provide additional support for the view that co-ownership creates problems? Um, I think the time series, I think I mentioned this before, I think the time series is interesting. It's not a sharp test, but it's, uh, it's important. Um, Second, I think there's this activity conundrum. The, most of the increase in ownership concentration comes from fairly passive investors like BlackRock and Vanguard. And I think Maria talked about this a little bit and she said it's in fact not the rise of these guys but it's the decline of the activists that's implied. I think it's interesting to kind of dig in here a little bit. Are, are these investors really informed and involved and how do they impact the role of activists and how does that work? I think this is a rich topic and something that you really want to know a little more about the mechanism. Um, and also on the mechanism, I think it would be interesting to know how owners communicate their desire for low RP to portfolio firms. Now, in the exact literal model that's in the paper, there's only two firms and then some very indirect communication might work. But if you think about my example with the two firms in an industry, that don't compete with each other, and then the third firm that does compete, it seems like the ownership owners have to tell each firm which kind of firm it is. It's not enough that the firm sort of generally knows what's going on in the industry. If firm one and firm two and firm three, they need to know which firm are we, comp which other firms are we competing with and which are we not competing with. And so there has to be some kind of communication and it will be interesting to know what the form is of that communication how do successful firms, successful CEOs, if you like, learn which kind of firm they are? How does Apple know if it's competing with Samsung or not? And so on. Okay, good. Sorry for going over. Okay, thanks, Bo. Uh, we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. Maria is gonna call on people. Maria, do you wanna take the stage again? I yeah. That's uh, uh, up to you. Um, just a, a few, thank you very much for, for your points, your comments. Regarding the, um, the rise in common ownership, yes, it's uh, through two, two channels, right? The increase in index funds and as well the mergers that have been happening within, uh, within the sector. So the BGI and the BlackRock, meaning th this was the largest one, but there have been as well many other mergers that, have, that are leading to this increase in uh, common ownership. Um, Yes, we will say more about the level of pay. I think that that's, that's a very, very good point. Uh, we, need to, we need to pin down better uh, in the data that. Regarding the, the scale problem, uh, regarding the, the change, you know, our first specification was using the arrowal samwick model, and therefore we had on the right-hand side changes in the value of, uh, of uh, your firm and in the value of peers but then we have moved on to a more modern specification using returns. So hopefully we have less of a scale issue in that sense. Um, 
And as you point out, it is important to as well move from this common ownership at the industry level to a more refined one at the firm level. And uh, you know, intuitively is saying, well, how, how much of my shareholders, if I take the top 10 shareholders, how much do they own in my peers? And with that measure, I can do uh, many more, um, you know, I can pin down the effect in a much more precise way. For the IV, yes, we will try the diff in diff. I think that that will help us as well. And regarding the welfare implications, uh, you know, this paper is a little bit, uh, it, it's narrow in the sense that we are trying to, to see how this link between ownership and the decision of prices and quantities may come about. But uh, more broadly speaking, common ownership helps uh, solve some free rider problems, right? So if we think, for example, from an innovation perspective, the free riding that takes place as I innovate, uh, we may well see that uh, maybe common ownership has a positive effect on other corporate decisions such as innovation. Right? Okay, yes. Yes. How do you adjust for the fact that your data source is 13F, so you're looking at publicly traded firms, and so how do you adjust for the fact that there's lots of firms that are not public, mm -hmm. um, you know, and there's fewer publicly traded firms over this time period? Mm -hmm. There might be certain industries with a lot of private competition, certain industries with relatively yes. little private competition. So that's question one, and question two on the industry definition is, does it make sense to look at uh, sectors that are tradable versus non-tradable? Mm -hmm. Because if it's non-tradable, then the domestic uh, in, uh, firms would be more, would, would presumably define the industry relative to, you know, yes. where it's tradable and then you're, you're dealing with the entire world. Yeah, this is a, a very good point. So, so far, because of the, the availability of data, we can only say something about uh, companies that are publicly trading. And because we take a stand and we say, look, this uh, common ownership using the MHHI delta goes hand in hand with the measure of concentration. Um, we are using both concentration measures that are only for data of firms that are publicly traded as well. So in that sense, we are consistent, but yes, we are missing you know, what is happening in the rest of, the, of, the, of that market that is not uh, publicly traded. What w our effort has been to say, well, let's define industries in a more economical, mm, uh, meaningful way and use the Hoberg and Phillips definitions and then define peers as well, say, well, you know, who, does, who do you compete? We, we know that uh, companies compete with peers that are as well in the same, uh, um, scale, of the same scale. So, um, you know, narrowing it by, by size as well within a peer, within a, a class of, uh, of uh, SIC codes or Hoberg and Phillips identifi uh, identifier, then that helps us to identify. What we are mostly interested in to, is to identify who are the peers and are you deciding to um, have a, a compensation contract that puts more weight onto those. So, because we have, um, you know, publicly traded companies, we are hoping to think that the, their peers are as well gonna be publicly traded. But yeah, we understand that we are a bit narrow in that respect, yes. Yeah, I have a question of how you think about the plausibility of the mechanism, what's going on there. And you said in the, on some of your slides that uh, Vanguard and BlackRock, they are probably not actively pushing this. And I think Vanguard has 19 people in their corporate governance department. So yeah. just the resources to do anything more firm specific are probably not there. And then you, but you, 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 did, you did say that maybe an alternative story is that they are sort of crowding out the more active investors. And mm -hmm. I think that's a good story. I wonder your natural, ex your experiment with the mutual fund scandal, mm -hmm. to what extent it actually gets at that margin of institutional ownership. Because if you're thinking of crowding out, well then we have to think about who are these investors replacing? Whose place are they taking? If one index yes. fund picks up the stock of another index fund, yes. then actually nothing is happening on that margin. It has mm -hmm. to be that somehow the ownership of the index funds increases at the expense of either actively managed funds or individual investors or somebody like that who, um, because mm. of their trading or because of their own governance activities, would be more pushing yes. for Yeah, we need to like explore this. more on that. Uh, 
I, th I think that you know it's a little bit beyond the scope of the paper to, to move to this next level and say, on, and how does this happen, this crowding out? Uh, so to know more about as common ownership rises, what is the effect on, for example, voting outcomes? And there is a lot of, uh, you know, the, we, there is data that we could help us tell something about that, and as well about the presence of other activists that are uh, pushing for proxy fights. Is it the effect that we have? We see less proxy fights. Are they less successful? I think that that's, you know, those are very important questions that uh, are, are open yet. Yes. I want to push a little bit more on the uh, on mutual effect, on your assumptions about the mutual Because it, it seems to me in many respects uh, you're treating them something like a black box. So how is, Van, how is Vanguard affected by whether their portfolio companies compete or don't compete? And I'm going to offer you a hypothetical that may be two years ahead of the, uh, two years ahead of the market. Uh, that is, two years from now, there are a fair number of predictions that the, uh, uh, the management fee that Vanguard will charge for an index fund will be zero, which is to say they will not be affected by the value of their index fund. They'll make their money off, uh, off securities lending. Mm -hmm. So what is it about the utility of Vanguard in my hypothetical mm -hmm. that suggests they care one way or another about whether um, about whether their uh, their portfolio their, their four banks or their four uh, airlines compete or they don't compete they make identical uh, Vanguard makes identical returns uh, regardless of what happens um, in the product market because they're not getting paid based on uh, based on asset value so that's the Vanguard folks mm -hmm. um, take now a, f a firm that's choosing. Um, you're modeling the, the fund as if the fund had a collective utility function. That is, yes. uh, they may run 15 firms, but before that's right or not, you need to look at how the portfolio managers are compensated. And if the portfolio managers are compensated on a relative performance basis, then they're making a judgment in their trading about whether they want, whether they want to support uh, competition among or not. And my point is simply that um, your initial model mm -hmm. makes s assumptions about the behavior of the owners, um, which there are at least alternative assumptions that may actually fit uh, I, yes, yes, no, I, I understand closely. your point. I understand and it, you your just, point. You need to unpack yes, yes. that a little so, bit. So, you know, one, one possible response is to say, does the Vanguard fund individually care for more or less competition? No, they don't. But does the family care for more competition? The family of funds. So when they vote, when BlackRock votes, they, they don't vote individually. Uh, each, each fund. It's, it's as a pool. It's as a family of funds that they that they coordinate, no? well, I, I, as long as, you know, my interactions with, with BlackRock, they say that they centralize, they centralize the, the voting. They will centralize voting on salary, centralize voting on corporate governance. Uh, they may very well not centralize voting on okay. things like activist issues, because that affects their portfolio, their, their active portfolio mm -hmm. managers' compensation. In the end, I mean, in some ways, what your model suggests is that mutual funds will be, will care relatively little about compensation issues, and will care a lot when activists think that the compensation policies generate a generate an ability generate. for activists to make money by making changes, and the voting on okay. BlackRock votes roughly 50-50 on activist campaigns. So getting the motivation of okay. the funds right, uh, <coughs> that's, that's a very have a lot to the interpretation of the mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for your point, yes. Um, Renee? 
Uh, yeah, I wanted to, to suggest maybe a more direct test of the common ownership and, uh, com and compensation link. Um, so my understanding is that a lot of firms actually have compensation peers. Yes. Right. And so um, I think it would be really interesting to look at whether as common ownership changes, whether the compensation peers change. Yes. Right. So getting data on that would actually be enable you to get more direct evidence on um, what the channel might be. So if, yes. if they add or they subtract people mm -hmm. from their compensation peers. Yes. And in fact, they disclose as well the peers that they compete against. So we have these two groups, the ones that they say they compete and then the ones that they are going to be... Uh, you know, doing the, the relative performance with their compensation peers. So that can be very useful. Thank you. Yes. 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 Jeff Gordon, yes. I, I just want to follow up on a point that, uh, that Bo, Bo made, um, because I think it's, it's critical. Um, and that is uh, the change in uh, the impact here over time, because um, uh, in part because of what Ron said. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, unless you're able to show that over time his concentration goes up um, and as the presence of active funds in the business goes down, then the plausibility of the story um, uh, is, is under question. And then yes. we get to a situation where Mike Klausner at the very first meeting of the GC, GC said in response to the positive results on um, the GMI index, um, um, that's not my issue. The fact that a result without a theory is there, you know, is a problem for the, um, the empiricist. It's not a problem for the theory. Um, I mean, and so, and so literally your results would suggest that the effect that you suggest would strongly be increasing now relative to in the past. Mm -hmm. And if it, because of the nature yes. of the business, Absolutely. right? And so yeah. if you can't show that, it seems to me that that's the hockey stick. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're able to show that, then it seems to okay. me, then you've, then that's a, we can, gets yeah. attention. But if you can't, then there's a curiosity and maybe which we, the other, you know, it's, it's, it's. I, I totally agree with you. We should see a stronger effect the, the, in, the, um, in the last years, right? Because common ownership has been rising um, strongly from the 2000 onwards. And uh, I mean, so we should really wanna, see a result from uh, I mean, the, the other thing you want to look at, it seems to me, is the impact of, say, on pay. Mm -hmm. so, so that was an exogenous change in the governance uh, environment that these firms faced. And so if your story is correct, then there ought to be a difference in, uh, uh, that reflects itself in the, the, the degree of support for different comp plans conditional on the concentration effect that you're showing yes. or the industry effect that you're showing. Um, uh, after say on pay is put in, because then, right? I mean, there ought to be an effect that uh, that manifests itself in the actual challenges to compensation that's brought after this exogenous change in the governance landscape. Yes, I, I agree. The say on pay, the the challenge with say on pay is that most of these proposals get passed. So what's really interesting, what we would really would like to have, uh, you know, to open the box is understand more the engagements. How much do they engage before they go on and they vote on the say and pay? There are uh, very few votes that get challenged for us. So it's going to be hard for us to see in the data as common ownership increases whether this is going to have any variation on the say and pay outcome. I mean, we're going to look into that, but I know the say and pay data and uh, it's one of the challenges of the literature is that, yes, most of them pass. And what we're really looking for is what happened before they pass, because actually they engaged a lot. Because missing uh, a say on pay vote has dramatic impact on, uh, on the CEO tenure uh, and, and the company. I'm gonna, we're going to look more into that yes. at the back. My name is uh, Guy Jupp, and for the last uh, 20 years, I've been deeply involved as a shareholder in engaging with companies about compensation. I was uh, global head of governance and stewardship at Standard Life Investments. And 
uh, with the benefit of that uh, interaction, I just wanted to uh, challenge in part the representation that 45% of engagement meetings feature compensation. And it was the word feature that I particularly wanted to focus on because in my experience, um, compensation may be mentioned in meetings, but it is not the same as uh, the shareholder engaging about compensation, and it is not the same as consulting about compensation. And uh, that aspect of the, um, the, the proposition in terms of the 45% of engagement meetings featuring compensation is something which I suggest could deserve a little bit more in-depth uh, analysis as to quite what feature does mean. The second point that I would like to raise is actually there are two players who have not been mentioned uh, hitherto in this discussion. The first is the role of proxy uh, voting advisors, particularly on, say, on pay, but in terms of proxy voting advisors enabling not only indexed funds, but other funds who are not well resourced to uh, engage in these matters, to actually coalesce around a particular uh, view. And the impact of uh, voting uh, agencies on compensation committees is something which I think should not be underestimated, particularly for large banks who have a reputation, a competitive reputation. Anyone has seen as what has happened with Wells Fargo to influence. And finally, the other um, player who has not been mentioned, particularly in the banking sector, is the role of regulators uh, on pay. In Europe, in particular, we have seen this, but this is a global phenomenon. It was mentioned earlier about the welfare implications and the interest of the public uh, and increasingly politicians in, in, in terms of co executive compensation in the banking sector. And in terms of homogenization of policy, and the, the, the structure of it, the role of regulators, I think will be part of the contributory factor as well as the increased number and proportion of common ownership as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, you know, it makes me reflect on this difference between featuring or consulting on. I think it would be interesting, for example, to explore who are the consultants. If we would have the data on compensation, who are the consultants? Because as the consultants consult firms in the same industry, it may well be the case that they are suggesting the same contracts to all these firms, and maybe that is the channel. We don't know, but that's, that may, may, makes me think. One more question, okay, then. Thank you. So I wanted to ask a little bit about your pay performance sensitivity result. Okay. Uh, the regressions you run, where you make the dependent variable, the Edmonds 2009 the, pay The wealth performance. Yeah, that's right. So this is an, actually an interesting result. I have questions about mechanism and other things, but let's just focus on this for now. The intuition of the paper seems to be that as common ownership rises, yes. pay performance sensitivity falls. Falls. For and, own, yes. Yeah, and for increases own. increases for yeah. years. So it's, that strikes me as um, you interpret that as consistent with the overall thrust of the paper which is, look, if you have, um, basically what Edmonds is measuring is stocks and options in that particular firm. And you say, look, the less you have of this, the less likely you are to have incentives to maximize your own firm's value mm -hmm. relative to other firms' value. See, it's funny, I actually have the opposite intuition. Okay. And the reason is that what Edmonds is measuring is stock and option ownership, but remember, these are not meaningfully indexed against peers. And in the firms that you're looking at, stock and own, uh, option ownership paths are highly correlated with each other. That is, to own stock in your, and indeed this has been a subject of a great deal of criticism mm -hmm. of stock and options as a pay device, because they don't reward relative performance, but instead rising tides or falling tides tend to drive the outcomes of stock and option pay. So actually what you find is that the more common ownership there is, the less stock and options one holds that tend to reward increasing industry profits or, fall, or, or penalize um, falling industry profits. So I'm wondering whether you think that this, inter this interpretation is one worth focusing on, and I just want to be clear, one thing that's really hard to do with the Edmonds measure mm -hmm. is to say anything at all about relative performance because, because of a, an artifact of securities and tax law. These stocks and options cannot be indexed against competitors' stocks and options. It almost is never the yes. case. Yes. So what you might consider doing is seeing the relationship between own company 
uh, stock performance and other company stock performance okay. and doing heterogeneity heterogene heterogene analysis on those questions. Because what you're telling me now is that the more common ownership there is, the less stock and options folks own? Not own, the sensitivity lowers. I'm talking about an elasticity here. So the wealth performance sensitivity is negatively correlated with common ownership. But you know, you know, but it's a, yeah, yeah, I mean, no, that's for point taken. Yeah, we need to talk more and, and because I, have I to want tell to you, understand where It seems to me it's actually the opposite result. Yeah, because okay. the more the, 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 your intuition is that the more stocks and options of your own firm that you own, the more incentive you have to maximize your own firm's value. Mm -hmm. But because these are these uh, most uh, sensitive to industry wide shocks, that's not right. I think that we are not that far away in terms of the way we interpret, but I might have not made my clear, myself extremely clear on that. But I think that, yeah, I, I understand your point, that uh, stock, uh, and option perform, uh, stock and options will depend as well on peer performance, and therefore... Um, More than anything else. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. 